Dennis Hurley is in one of the meanest businesses on Earth. Welcome to the jungle. It's the ice cream business. You know, on the outside, it's it's fun. It's uh, it's ice cream. You know, everybody loves ice cream. It's sweet. It's kids. It's uh, happiness. And the reality of the of the business side of ice cream is it's one of the dirtiest businesses there is. His family created the mighty Hagen Das, the biggest luxury ice cream in the world. His father Kevin ran the company. Hagen Das was a steamroller. It was just going, and what was in its path, it took care of. When two hippie ice cream makers tried to take on the might of the empire, they were sucked into a David and Goliath battle for survival. I think what Hagen Das was trying to do was illegal. And the question was, would a small company like Ben and Jerry's be able to fight that? This is a war. This isn't about friendships. It's not about respect. You know, respect to the guys who ultimately win. The upstarts met at school 35 years ago in New York. Ben and I were not really in the mainstream of social activities in school. We were not cool kids. We were the nerdy kids. After school, they grew beards, moved into an apartment with their dog, Malcolm, and got a succession of dead-end jobs. Uh, I think we were the only two of our friends that uh, did not appear to be uh, getting anywhere in the world, so to speak. So uh, I thought, well, maybe I could try starting my own business and maybe I could do it with Jerry. United by a love of food, the hippies agreed the best conceivable business was one that involves a great deal of eating. The two big things that were happening in food at the time were uh, homemade ice cream and uh, bagels. We actually went to a used restaurant supply place and priced out equipment for making bagels and it was $40,000 and we knew that was more money than we had, so we figured ice cream had to be cheaper. We picked ice cream. They sent off for a $5 correspondence course in ice cream making, then turned an abandoned petrol station in Burlington, Vermont, into the town's first homemade ice cream parlor. Ben and Jerry's was born. Ben and I were working there all the time, and people obviously figured out who we were. And I think people liked the ice cream, and they liked the idea that, you know, these were two regular guys opening up a little store, and uh, they wanted to support what we were doing. So everybody came. The shop was a surprise hit and became the hangout of every fun-loving eccentric in town. It even had its own resident blues piano man, Don Rose. Ben and Jerry's was on the corner of St. Paul Street up from Pine. Ben and Jerry's was on the corner. St. Paul Street up from Pine. Oh, it was just uh, the funkiest ice cream shop I ever been in, that's for sure. Ben and Jerry were just, you know, all smiles and the ice cream was great. The people that worked there were great. You had the smell of the big kettle of hot fudge just smoldering away there behind the counter and it's just the smells were just enough to put you in heaven. Ben and Jerry made every day one big party. And when the day's all done, I'm gonna sing my scuba song. The key was their unique ice cream. In a world of boring old chocolate, coffee, and vanilla, Ben and Jerry made weird flavors with lumps in. Ah. Nearly everything they laid their hands on wound up in the ice cream. Yes, look at this. Oh. <laughs> a giant salami. Just <laughs> <laughs> didn't make it down. <laughs> didn't make the turn. They were the original oh. ice cream anarchists. This is good. United by an unwavering devotion to the chunk. 
That's a huge chunk. I mean, you know, you put that in uh, in your mouth, you know, in a, in a teaspoon, and, you know, you got a significant percentage of the volume occupied by the teaspoon that uh, that is nut. And, um, you know, as opposed to, you know, this kind of bullshit, you know, I mean, this is absurd. I mean, ice cream companies put this in ice cream and they call it pecan? No, you need a big mother pecan. How's that? That first spectacular summer, Burlington went chunk crazy. There was just one crucial flaw in their business plan. It's uh, damn cold here in uh, Burlington, Vermont, and uh, sure enough, come the winter, nobody was buying our ice cream. We started selling to some local restaurants to try to survive, and then uh, after we bought a truck, uh, it was costing us more money to repair this old truck that we bought than we were making selling ice cream. That was a really rough time. Bankruptcy loomed. They managed to stay alive that winter by selling tubs of ice cream through local grocery stores. But to be a real commercial success, they'd have to start selling outside their home state. All we were thinking about was uh, what we needed to do to keep things going. We had virtually no money. Uh, I, I became the salesperson for the, the company. Uh, and uh, my task was to uh, sell our ice cream to independent ice cream distributors uh, in the neighboring states. Ben and Jerry were about to feel the chill of business reality. Lesson number one, big supermarket chains don't buy ice cream from hippies straight out of the back of pickup trucks. They use a handful of specialist distributors. To get onto the shelves, Ben and Jerry would have to enlist the support of a middleman. Most distributors would view an untried product like theirs as a commercial gamble. If they couldn't be persuaded to see things differently, Ben and Jerry's dreams of expansion would just melt away. Top of their hit list was leading distributor, Dennis Silver. One day I get to the yard and there's this car out there and the, the windows are all fogged up and iced up and I say, geez, what's that car doing here? I come into my office and later on that morning, Ben Cohen shows up and he looked like he'd just uh, gotten out of bed and slept in his clothes and so forth and he sat in front of me and I said, uh, geez, Ben, how long you been here? He said, oh, a little while, I, I was uh, out in my car. I said, was that your car out there that was all frosted up? Said, yeah, that was, that was my car. He says, uh, I arrived here middle of the night, 4 o'clock in the morning, and uh, it's the cheapest hotel I could find. So uh, I just kind of went to sleep, and uh, I woke up when it got real cold. I would drive there at night and uh, get to the distributor's place and sleep in my car until, uh, until, the, you know, until my appointment the next morning. One middleman wouldn't be enough. They also needed to bag the other key New England distributor, Chuck Green. The way Ben walked in the door, when you look from a standpoint of who you'd buy ice cream from or a food product, Ben just didn't connote food. It connoted that he, he ate a ton of food, but not that he could sell food successfully. He sat in my office, and after a few minutes, he got very comfortable and put his feet up on my desk, and uh, he was wearing tennis sneakers. He said, uh, do you have any coffee or anything like that? You know, I haven't eaten in, in about eight or 10 hours. And Ben, you know, uh, liked to eat. And uh, we had, uh, he, he consumed quite a bit in this little kitchen that we had. And he said, I'm not quite ready to see you yet. I'm, I'm going to eat a little bit. And even in our environment, Ben was calling the shots. Both Chuck and Dennis fell for Ben's charm and his chunks. Ben and Jerry's became the latest entrance into the so-called super premium ice cream category, a market dominated by one company. 
With more than a 70% share of all super premium sales, the undisputed king of luxury ice cream was haagen -Dazs. Kevin Hurley was the president of haagen -Dazs. I had a woman tell me that it was better than sex with her husband. I had another woman tell me that she knew how haagen -Dazs came to the United States, that she uh, had heard that Frank Sinatra brought it to the United States. I mean, you couldn't argue with these people. If you would, if you would say to them, look, let me tell you the, the real story, they wouldn't accept that. haagen -Dazs was the brainchild of Kevin's father-in-law, Reuben Mattis. In 1959, he created an ice cream in his New York factory that sounded like it came from much further afield. Reuben always used to say, you want someone to notice you? Take a salami and put it under your arm. You know, that was one of his remarks. Be different. He always liked the Danes. He loved the Danish people, you know? He says, and I'm gonna give it, I'm gonna put the Danish flag on there. You know, something foreign. He says, if I put something foreign in the ice cream cabinet and people will look at it, they'll say, what's that? And he did. By 1984, haagen -Dazs had become a subsidiary of Pillsbury, a gigantic food conglomerate that owned a slate of successful companies, including Green Giant and Burger King. Pillsbury at the time was a $4 billion company. It's big. <laughs> we didn't really talk about billions in those days. By comparison, Ben and Jerry were a tiny blip. But they were now growing outside Vermont and were planning on moving to a new, much larger factory. Then, out of the blue, their distributors received a fateful phone call. haagen gave me a call and somewhere in 1984, spring of 84, and suggested at that time that uh, it was time for me to make a decision as to which product line I was going to carry. Do you want to carry haagen -Dazs, or do you want to carry Ben & Jerry's? We said it's us or them, exactly right. We said it's us or them. Mm -hmm. We felt we needed a commitment from the distributor. We were just stunned at this uh, comment coming from haagen -Dazs this huge company where we were selling trailer loads of ice cream versus this minuscule amount of Ben and Jerry's we were selling, that they had made us, you know, they had drawn the line in the sand and said, you're going to have to make a decision. When someone says to you, you have to make a decision, you have two children, which one do you decide on? Um, do you want the one that was born first or do you want the baby, the one that was born second? Or how do you make that decision? You love them both equally. Um, some people can't relate to that because it's a business and you say, well, how do you love to ice cream product lines. Um, it's no different, it's the oxygen that we breathe as far as a company goes. They were both oxygen lines coming into our company and somebody, you have to snip one, tie one off, so you have to learn to breathe with one lung. We didn't say to the distributor, you can't carry Ben & Jerry's. We said to the distributor, look, you know what, what you're doing is you're, you're asking us to, uh, or we're asking you to make a choice. You can carry Ben & Jerry's. We don't have any problem with that. We'll, we'll restructure our distribution system if need be. If you want to carry Ben & Jerry's, that's up to you. But you can't carry both brands. It was not their distribution network. It was an independent distribution network of uh, independently owned companies that were delivering many brands of ice cream. And for some reason, haagen felt like it was their distributors <laughs> as opposed to these independent business people. If they were going to say that 
if a distributor carries haagen they can't carry Ben & Jerry's, essentially, there was no distributors that we could sell to to get our ice cream to retail stores. And so we'd be out of business. haagen demanded that Chuck and Dennis sign a legal agreement promising they'd stop selling Ben & Jerry's. After working so hard to grow their business, the hippies knew they were on the brink of losing it all. In desperation, they arranged a secret crisis meeting with their distributors at Boston's Logan Airport. We met, discussed for probably a couple hours, uh, what ifs, what if we don't do this, or what if we don't do that, and how could we uh, fight off someone with the large number of uh, resources and the funds that they have versus Ben & Jerry's, which is a relatively small company, didn't have any marketing funds, certainly didn't have any attorney's fees or, or shall I say, uh, funds put aside to battle something like this. They had to find a way of raising enough money to mount a legal challenge. It was Ben who provided the inspiration. Ben said, I've got an idea. He said, I charge you X for ice cream. How about, Ben would think and think and said, how about if I had a dollar to every pint I sell you? Every sleeve of pints I'd sell you. And we all looked at each other and said, oh, here he goes again. Because he always had a different way of looking at things. And he said, this way, for you buy more ice cream, we keep putting this into a fund for a legal battle. And he said, I'll pay you back when we win. For the legal battle, they needed a lawyer. They chose one because his shoes were falling apart. It is true. I often have holes in my shoes. I actually have a hole in my shoe today I saw. you think I'd have fixed it by now, but it must be a different pair. Howie Fouguet had built his career defending large corporations. But when Ben and Jerry approached him, the urge to switch allegiance was irresistible. It was really a David and Goliath story. We were the small guy just asking for a fair crack at the consumer. Howie's first move was to write a stinging letter to Pillsbury, announcing his determination to defend Ben and Jerry vigorously in court. It would be wishful thinking on the part of your subsidiary's officers, that's haagen to imagine that it can bully Ben and Jerry's stifle its growth and cause it to roll over. Ben & Jerry's is a classic entrepreneurial success and its owners are aggressive. They like the taste of success and they will fight for it. haagen will have to learn to compete on the merits in the marketplace. That is the American way and that is what competition is all about. I think that summarized our, our position pretty well. Ben and Jerry's, uh, you know, these two country boys from Vermont were now going to sue us uh, because they wanted the right to use our distribution system to get their products to stores. Uh, because they didn't want to take the time and the trouble and the effort and the expense to go out and develop a distribution system on their own. So they sued us. Odds were that we were going to lose. You know, they were much bigger than us. The odds were that they were going to beat us. I mean, usually, that's what happens when a big company starts beating up on a little company. The big company wins. Pillsbury's crack in-house legal department boasted 17 lawyers. The 17th name on the list was assigned to the task of disposing of Howie and the hippies. Our list is... is uh, as is the way with, uh, with law firms or law departments, listed all of our attorneys alphabetically. I believe starting with Carter and ending with uh, Wegener. They certainly could have asked to speak with uh, Betsy Carter. That would have been fine with me. Pillsbury showed no sign of being rattled and coolly notified their distributors they had six weeks to get Ben and Jerry's ice cream off their trucks. Ben and Jerry knew they'd have to take matters into their own hands. We made a decision that uh, if we were, if we were going to go down, we were at least going to let uh, as many people as we knew, as we could, know what was going on. Uh, know that, uh, you know, the reason why you can't find Ben & Jerry's on the shelf is because this, this big corporation is trying to prevent you, the consumer, from having a choice about what kind of ice cream you want to buy. We wanted to make Pillsbury the target, not Haagen-Dazs, uh, Pillsbury being the parent company. And 
we felt like if uh, if it was just perceived as as Ben and Jerry's versus Haagen Dazs, it was going to be seen as just one ice cream company battling another one. But we wanted to, you know, demonstrate that it was this little uh, local ice cream company fighting this big uh, corporate conglomerate. They took it right to the top. They targeted the most powerful man within the giant Pillsbury Corporation. Distinguishing features, a fixed grin, a playful giggle, and a body made of flour, yeast, and water. His name, the Pillsbury Doughboy. The Doughboy is the company. Presidents and chairmen have come and gone, but the Doughboy has remained constant. We just wanted to give it a black eye. We, we wanted to uh, paint it as uh, kind of an evil little creature. <laughs> <laughs> Proud symbol of the company since the mid-60s, the Doughboy looked like he'd never hurt a fly. Ben and Jerry set out to portray him as the criminal mastermind behind a conspiracy to drive their business into the ground. The American people love the underdog. Uh, we knew that we were the underdog, there's no doubt about it, and we decided to play that for all it was worth. They made sure their battle cry was heard everywhere. T-shirts, badges, even the backs of buses demanded to know what's the doughboy afraid of. They set up a doughboy telephone hotline. In return for a campaign contribution of $1, callers received a bumper sticker and a letter of protest pre-addressed to the chairman of Pillsbury. They promoted a boycott of all Pillsbury products, which for them meant a self-sacrificing denial of their beloved Burger King. And just in case Pillsbury tried to turn a blind eye, Jerry launched a one-man picket outside their global corporate headquarters in Minneapolis. We didn't really know a thing about PR. Uh, we were just trying to survive. Uh, we were just doing whatever came into our heads, uh, whatever we could do to let the public know what was going on. The campaign was a public relations masterstroke. Pillsbury was stunned. Oh, I don't, I don't think they were happy to see the Doughboy getting bashed. I think, uh, <laughs> you know, that's, uh, <laughs> you know, the Doughboy is sacred. The Doughboy had never been under attack in that fashion uh, before in his career. The hippies were even attracting support from some unusual quarters. Ben obtained a photocopy of a letter sent to one of Pillsbury's board of directors. It was signed Charles Pillsbury. Uh, and we, you know, realized that, you know, this was Pillsbury's kid. <laughs> and he said, uh, you know, I'm very disappointed at the actions of the company against this small Vermont company, and uh, I look forward to discussing it with you, Dad, when, uh, when I see you for Christmas dinner. That drove home to management uh, how this whole ordeal could get twisted around in the mind of the public. We had really struck a vital chord when we combined the lawsuit with what's the Doughboy Afraid of campaign, attacking the Pillsbury Doughboy. That was like, af that was like going after Godmother and apple pie. <laughs> Look. Look. <laughs> <laughs> the Doughboy himself uh, was never <laughs> was never afraid of anything. <laughs> what went wrong is that the publicity became bigger than the dispute itself. The dispute was between Ben and Jerry's and haagen -Dazs. Those are the competitors. The personalization of the dispute on the back or on the stomach of the doughboy was uh, what uh, Pillsbury was, was very concerned about. The doughboy had nowhere to hide. With Pillsbury reeling under the public relations battering, Howie decided to pounce. I called Dick and I said, we're going to go into court on Ju Friday, July 5, and make a motion for a temporary restraining order. And we're going to get it, I said. It would be better for you if you signed a stipulation that gave us the same relief, but contained a sentence that said, Pillsbury neither 
did not admit any wrongdoing. Because if we get a court order, that will be item one in our press release that we will put out to the public. The Doughboy campaign uh, was constantly being broadcast and receiving additional publicity. But it seemed to make sense to us to get that dispute behind us quickly. If you're a corporate uh, situation, you make decisions defensively. Many times you make decisions not because of the circumstance, but because for the corporation it's the right decision to make at that particular time. You don't always make the business decision for the business reason. You make it for the, for the company, for the good of the company. Kevin Hurley signed an out-of-court settlement with Ben and Jerry's. In doing so, he agreed not to coerce any distributor to drop Ben and Jerry's ice cream. David had slain Goliath. To celebrate, Ben and Jerry ended their boycott of Burger King by buying their entire staff a Whopper. Victory tasted sweet. Ah, to sink your teeth into a nice, warm, soft, fluffy roll and then enter the layer of mayonnaise you know the uh what, how do you what do you what what is that mayonnaise like it's like slimy slimy yeah. slimy the, and then finally the climax of the burger the, the, bur chew. the burger chew uh, you know i'm telling you you know you don't appreciate a whopper until you've been whopper deprived <laughs> <laughs> it was a relief to win it was uh, it was not like, uh, oh, we've conquered the world. It was like, uh, oh, we're going to be able to stay in business and get our ice cream on the shelves. It was, uh, oh, it was a relief. As consumers sought out the ice cream behind the headlines, sales of Ben and Jerry's rocketed. By 1992, they were turning over more than $130 million and had become a serious rival to haagen -Dazs. The Doughboy had helped turn them into an ice cream superpower. I mean, no one had ever heard of Ben and Jerry's before, and no one would have heard for Ben and Jerry's for years and years. So, from a uh, a business point of view, it moved us forward so much more, even though that had never been our intent to begin with. Pillsbury, I'd I'd like to thank you for all the help that you gave us by. Uh trying to defeat us and put us out of business. Having you guys pick on us ended up to be the best thing that ever could have happened uh, in terms of getting our ice cream on the map. You know, it's nice to, nice to be there on the shelf with you. Thanks. But Kevin Hurley was no longer in charge of haagen -Dazs. By now, the ice cream kingpin had resigned, grown a ponytail, and started his own business. Alongside wife Doris and mother-in-law Rose, he created Mattis's Low Fat, America's newest ice cream company. It's tough to be uh, Goliath and then become David. I think it's a lot easier to be going the other way around. If you're David and you become Goliath, you feel good. But if you're once Goliath and you become David, it's a lot tougher. Fronting the business is Kevin's son, Dennis. Together, they're still locking horns with Ben and Jerry. Only this time, the tables have turned. I think Ben and Jerry's is the establishment now, I guess, would be the best way to describe it. You know, they're not the small entrepreneur. We're the small entrepreneur. Dennis is the man. Dennis is the point man for Mattis. He's running the business day to day, on the street. We've given him the killer instinct, and he's got the goals. I mean, he, you know, he's got a heritage behind him of success. Like Ben and Jerry before him, Dennis's dreams of expansion have met with a chilly reception from the big ice cream companies. When we first started out, I don't think anyone cared if we lived or died. But as we began to push our way into these supermarkets, the competition began to throw up every obstacle they could think of. On the street, at the headquarters level, these chains. And ultimately, it isn't going to matter. We just keep uh, banging away.
Despite their millionaire status, Ben and Jerry clung to their hippie roots and were celebrated as ethics-driven business visionaries. In 1993, they raked in $140 million and chose Great Britain as their first international conquest. The guided tour of their production line became the single biggest tourist attraction in the state of Vermont. And the ice cream that we can't use, we'll save that up until the end of the day. Then we ship that off to Hagen Doss, and that's what they sell for their ice cream. Although no longer in the same league as Ben and Jerry's, Mattis's were ready to expand their tiny empire. Now they needed the support of the big distributors to go nationwide. But two familiar adversaries made sure they were in for a nasty surprise. When we started distributing masks, one of the first customers that we got was uh, Southland Corporation, which operates 7-Eleven stores nationally in the United States. It was the first customer I said, that we got. I said, one of the first customers we got. Southland said that, you know, we want you in all our stores nationally, but you need to use existing distributors. So we went to visit the uh, Dryer's distributors at their corporate headquarters in California. And we had, I mean, we knew the people there. We had a long relationship with them. And uh, they told us that they had an agreement with Ben and Jerry's. And in that, distribu that distribution agreement with Ben & Jerry's, which was their right to distribute Ben & Jerry's, Ben & Jerry's had a clause which protected, which protected their right to tell dryers what kind of products they could carry. Ben & Jerry's would make the determination as to what was a competing brand. Right. Ben & Jerry's <laughs> said, no, you can't carry their brand, they're a competing brand. Be... They used exactly the same argument that we used against Ben & Jerry's 10 years earlier that Ben and Jerry's found distasteful and tried to sue us over. They used exactly the same argument. They said, we need the full and undivided attention of the distributors <laughs> in order to support when, our When brand. I called Jerry, that was the argument he gave me. He gave me the argument that they, they needed the full, undivided attention of their distributor dryers and that uh, Mattis, in his opinion, was a competitive product, which it wasn't because it was the only low-fat product on the market at the time. We had a customer that wanted the product. Dryers told us they were willing to distribute the product. And I said to Jerry, hey, Jerry, you remember back about uh, 12 years ago when you were standing in front of uh, the Pillsbury building with signs saying, what's the Doughboy afraid of? Well, tell me, Jerry, what's Ben and Jerry afraid of? What's Ben and Jerry afraid of? Now it was Ben and Jerry's turn to deal with upstarts trying to take a chunk of their business. They specifically target their product after haagen which is, you know, certainly a competitor of ours. And I think it's a little difficult to say for them that they compete with haagen but not Ben and Jerry's. It's that, why is it good now, but it, was, it well, wasn't good? Course. I mean, it's like That's so self-serving. It works both ways for them. The same argument well, works the, both when, ways. When the little guy becomes the big guy, you know, you know does, what, does you know, everything what? change? Absolutely. Does everything change? Yeah. The problem in the haagen situation with us was that haagen had tied up all the major distributors and said that, you know, you can't carry any other competitive ice creams. That would prevent any competitive ice cream from getting into dis distribution. With us, we've picked one distributor and we've said, you know, we have an exclusive relationship with each other, but there's lots of other options that are available uh, to other ice cream companies. Mattises know they're in for a long, hard fight, but they say they're here to stay and they've no intention of letting two millionaire hippies get the better of them. This is a rough and tumble business, and, uh, you know, you can't sit around and pout about this stuff. You better do something about it. So, you know, if Ben and Jerry's felt that they were, uh, weren't given a fair shake, they certainly did something about it, and, uh, and they've built a very successful ice cream business for themselves. And, and in our own way, we hope to build another successful ice cream business in Madison's and, uh, you know, we'll deal with whatever deck we're dealt. The facts with us is that we are not the bad guys. I mean, certainly our company is bigger than it used to be, and our brand is better known than it used to be, but we're not actively trying to keep competitors off the shelves. I mean, we're not actively trying to help competitors get on the shelves, but... Uh, we're not trying to keep them off either.
If you're listening, Jerry, you know, why stop us? We're going to be there someday anyway. Why not just let us in? <laughs> you know, at least, the, you know, they got rid of us once. Here we are again. We're like Freddy. You know, they can't kill us. <laughs> I'm not, never, ever, ever going to let somebody else put me out of business. So we are going to fight the fight, buy the trucks, run the business, keep the product on the shelf, without respect to Ben and Jerry's, haagen or anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> ¶¶